In this episode, I wanted to talk a little bit about debugging. Uh, debugging is something that I probably should have talked about at the very beginning, but uh, until we actually had some programs of reasonable complexity to talk about, it didn't really seem like it would probably mean much to anyone. So now that we're actually starting to get a little bit done, let's, uh, let's discuss the subject a little bit. Uh, basically what debugging is, is the process of going through your program and making sure that it works correctly. Uh, as programs become more and more complex, there's more and more chance that uh, problems will crop up in the code that you write. Chances are, so far, in uh, some of the different things you've done, you've probably run into some situations where things didn't act or work exactly the way you wanted them to. And uh, debugging is basically a way to kind of help us get through that. Now, it sometimes helps to kind of know from the beginning that there are basically two types of bugs that can occur in a computer program. One of them is called a syntax bug. A uh, syntax bug or a syntax error is uh, simply something that comes up through incorrect use of the language itself. If we forget to put a semicolon where it's needed, if we forget to declare a variable, if we mistype a variable's name, if we uh, leave out a curly brace, any of those different things would be considered syntax bugs because they are basically uh, us, the programmer, doing something that is against the rules of the language. Syntax bugs tend to be the easiest ones to fix because in most cases the browser will recognize that there is a syntax problem and will actually point out the line to you that uh, contains that particular problem. So they tend to be ones that you can fix pretty quickly and easily. The other type of bug, of course, that can occur is a little bit more complex called a logic bug or a logic error. Logic bugs aren't brought about through incorrect use of the language. They're brought about by illogical use of the language. Uh, a lot of times when I think of uh, syntax versus logic bugs, uh, if you compare it to uh, a baking recipe, for example, a syntax bug might be uh, reading the wrong measurement, for example, putting in a cup instead of a teaspoon, where a logic bug would be more like following all the steps correctly, but maybe not following them in the proper order, uh, uh, forgetting to stir the cake before you actually put it in the oven, something along those lines. So logic bugs tend to be a lot more insidious. They tend to be a lot harder to track down and uh, a lot harder to correct. So those are the ones that you'll actually find that you probably end up spending the majority of the time on. As far as uh, fixing bugs in our programs, there's a number of different ways we can go about it. Uh, one of them is that some web browsers, not all, but some, uh, actually provide some in-browser help for correcting both uh, syntax and logic problems that may occur in our programs. Uh, I would certainly encourage you to use a browser that offers some type of help in these areas whenever you're developing a page that has JavaScript on it uh, so that you're not just shooting in the dark. Uh, some other ways that we can sometimes get a little help with our debugging is through the use of document.writelines or through the use of alerts. You'll find that what uh, debugging a logic problem often comes down to is making sure that what you think the browser is doing is actually what it's doing. And what the document.writelines and alerts can do for you is that you can actually kind of pepper them throughout your code so that the browser will spit out the different values of different variables or let you know what step it's actually on as it's executing through your script so that you can make sure that what the browser is actually doing uh, is in sync with what it is that you expect it to be doing. This will often reveal uh, a lot of different problems that uh, might otherwise have just kind of flown right by and you might not have noticed. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these different, uh, some of these different techniques for debugging programs and, uh, and uh, kind of see how they actually work in some of our different browsers. All right, let's start by taking a look at syntax errors. Um, don't need anything too terribly complex, of course, for us to be able to create some syntax errors. So let's start off here. Uh, you can see I have a simple little uh, web page put together. I just have an H1 in the body followed by a set of script tags. What I'm gonna do here inside the script tags is I'm gonna create a variable called X and I'm gonna assign it a value of 100. Next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a document.write line and I'm going to ask JavaScript to print out the value of Y. Now, of course, the syntax error there is fairly obvious. I have a uh, variable called x. I'm trying to print out a variable called y, which certainly is not going to work. So if I take a look at that in Safari, what we end up with is basically nothing. But we didn't really get nothing at all. 
you'll notice that up here on Safari's menu, I have a, a develop menu. If you uh, are using Safari and the develop menu doesn't show up, what you'll want to do is go to, uh, uh, on, on Mac anyway, go to the Safari menu, go to preferences. I forget exactly where preferences is if you're using uh, Safari for Windows, but I'm sure if you dig around a little bit, you'll be able to find it. Once you get into the preferences, if you go here to the advanced section down at the very bottom, there's a checkbox you can check called show develop toolbar or show develop menu in toolbar. Simply checking that box will turn on the develop menu. If you then come up here to the develop menu, you'll notice that there's an option in there called show error console. If I click on that, okay, it will either as a separate window or as a bottom pane in the current window pull up a uh, uh, error console, a debugging console. What it does is it shows me here sort of in the top section the uh, actual HTML code itself including you can see my JavaScript tags and then down here at the very bottom is the debugging console itself where it tells me there is a reference error it can't find variable Y and it mentions to me that this is coming from the file called syntaxerrors.html on line 18. And if I actually go ahead and click on that link, it takes me right to that part of the JavaScript, puts this red bubble next to it to make it very obvious to me that it has uh, exactly where it is that it is seeing that error occur. So Safari has done a fine job of finding that particular syntax error and pointing it out to me. Let's take a look at the same file then in Firefox. If I uh, refresh my view here in Firefox, kind of like in Safari, nothing at all shows up. If I come up here to the uh, Tools menu in Firefox, they have an option in here also called Error Console. And if I click on it, it pulls up this separate window where it shows me my errors for the current page. So uh, Firefox also saves up errors that it has from other pages. So if you ever come into the error console here in Firefox and there's an overwhelming number of errors and you don't think all of them are actually yours, just click the clear button right? and uh, that will reduce it down to just the errors uh, uh, that are basically yours. You might have to go back to the actual page and hit refresh again. Let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to hit clear. I'll close this window, refresh my view, and then I'll go back to the error console again. And then I know all the errors that I'm actually seeing there are just mine. And again, they give me a little bit of a link here. Uh, they mention that uh, the name of the file that the error is coming from, the actual error here is that Y is not defined, and it's saying it's coming from line 18. Let me click that link. And sort of like Safari did, just slightly less pretty, it pulls up the source code for that file and in this case highlights the line where Firefox is detecting that there's a syntax error. Uh, so like I was saying, syntax errors are generally fairly easy to track down because the browser will usually do a pretty good job of finding those for you and uh, pointing them out, making them a lot easier to correct. So if I go ahead and fix my syntax error here, go back to my browser, here I'm going to go back to uh, uh, Safari, hit refresh, okay? no errors shown down in the error console now. Back over in Firefox, hit refresh, the output showing up like it should. And if I go to the error console, the error is still being shown. But like I mentioned, Firefox likes to save up old errors. So if I go ahead and clear what's there, refresh my view in Firefox, go back to the error console again, no new errors are showing. So <clears throat> no syntax errors in this document right now. Uh, you'll it, it's probably kind of conspicuous that I'm not using Internet Explorer uh, at all to show this to you, uh, despite the fact that Internet Explorer is probably the browser that a lot of you tend to use pretty frequently. There's actually two reasons I'm not showing you how to debug JavaScript in Internet Explorer. One of them is that I just don't have access to it. I'm obviously working on a Mac. There is no Mac version of Internet Explorer, and I don't want to switch to another machine or pollute mine by putting Internet Explorer on it. The other reason is that Internet Explorer Explorer really doesn't have any debugging tools for JavaScript built into it. So more or less with Internet Explorer, you are more or less sort of on your own. So there really wouldn't be a whole lot to show you there one way or the other. But um, that does give you an idea of how we can track down some syntax errors in, uh, in JavaScript in either the Safari web browser or Firefox, both of which are available for both Mac and Windows. So in developing JavaScript, I would certainly highly recommend that you use one of those two browsers, whichever one you prefer. 
Now let's take a look at logic errors. Uh, since logic errors are a little bit more complicated, let's actually put together a little script here. Uh, I will uh, purposely leave a logic error in it that I know is going to occur. And uh, we'll see if we can use some of the different tools and techniques that are available to us to debug it and correct this little program. What I'm going to want this little program to do is I'm going to want it to allow the user to enter a series of numbers and then what I want the program to do is basically find the average of those numbers which means the program will first have to total uh, find the total of all the numbers that were entered by the user and then after that it'll need to divide by however many numbers the user actually entered. So here inside the body let me go ahead and throw in a set of script tags to get the um, numbers from the user, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an input variable and then I'm going to use a prompt statement to allow the user to enter the numbers. I'm going to tell the user enter a series of numbers uh, with spaces between them. There we go. So the user will enter a series of numbers. Each number should have a space between it, assuming the user is following instructions. What I'm going to do next then is I'm going to create a new array called nums and the way I'm going to get that array is I'm going to take the numbers that the user entered and I'm going to use the uh, split function that we talked about for strings and pass it the space as a delimiter. So um, I'm going to take the, the string that they entered with all the numbers in it, a space between each one. We'll split that string everywhere there's a space. That will then result in an array being returned. That array that's returned will then have each one of the individual numbers they entered in each one of the elements of the array. So once that's done, what I need to do next is I need to actually total those numbers up. Uh, to do this, I'm actually going to need to uh, uh, create a variable. I'm going to call it total, and I'll initialize it to zero. And then I'm going to need to actually use a function or a method of arrays that I don't believe we've talked about previously called the for each method. Uh, hopefully it doesn't come as any surprise to you knowing that arrays are a type of JavaScript object that arrays can have behaviors, basically methods or functions that are built into them. The one that I'm going to use here, like I mentioned, is called for each. So it more or less looks like this. Right. The way the for each function actually works is you pass it another function. So here I'm going to create another function like that. So that entire function that I'm putting in there is inside the parentheses for the for each function. And what JavaScript is actually going to do is for each one of the separate elements in the array nums, it is going to call the function that we're writing right here. You'll notice that the function that we're writing and passing to for each, I set it up so that it's passed a value called v. What JavaScript will do is when it calls this function for each element, it will actually pass the value of that element to this inner function. So that value will end up stored here in the variable v. So all I need to do then is just add v to my total. So if I enter the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 with a space between each one, how this is going to play out is that for the first element, which is the number 1, it will take the number 1, put it into the variable v, and execute this function. So v1 will get added to the total. It'll then go to the next element of the nums array, 2. Right? It'll take that value, store it in v, and call this function. Right? So 2 gets added to the total. By the time it's gone through all of them, the total should contain the total of all the different numbers that the user entered. What I'm going to do next then is to actually go and find the average itself. To do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the total and I'm going to divide it by the length of the num array, nums array. So the nums array has all the numbers the user originally entered in it. If the user entered three nums, three numbers, then the size of the nums array will be three. If the user entered 12 numbers, then the size of the nums array will be 12. So I'm just taking whatever the total of all those numbers are and dividing it by how many numbers existed, which should then give me the average. So then finally, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to print out that average. Uh, let me do it this way. The average is, there we go, and print out the average. So not a long or horribly complicated program, but uh, there should be an error in there that we will uh, run into here in just a second. So let me start off over here in uh, Safari, 
Okay. I'm going to reload my page. And there's my prompt. Enter a series of numbers with spaces between them. So let me enter one, two, three, four, five with a space between each one. When I click the OK button then, it'll go through the rest of the process and display the average. Huh. And it tells me that the average of one, two, three, four, and five is 2,469. So definitely an error in there, isn't there? Right? If I try the same thing over in Firefox, right? one, two, three, four, five, I get the exact same answer. So it's a persistent error. It's not something that's being caused by one browser or the other. There's definitely something wrong in my JavaScript code. So what could the problem actually be? Well, back over here in Safari, if I go and I take a look at my error console, there are no errors. If I do the same thing over in Firefox, error console, no errors. So this is definitely not a syntax error. This is actually a logic error, which as I mentioned, can be quite a bit harder to track down. So we've got a number of different ways that we can actually go about trying to find this particular error. Uh, one of them would be to use either document.writelines or alerts uh, kind of spattered throughout our code to help us keep track of what's actually going on in here. Uh, more or less what we'd want to be looking at is uh, the values of the different variables. Uh, if you think about it, some of these different variables we're never actually seeing the value of currently. We never actually see the nums array. We never actually see the value of total those kinds of things, for example. Uh, if it was a longer and more complicated script, we might also want to use document.writelines or alerts to also simply keep track of sort of the order that things that are happening in, making sure that functions are executing when we expect them to function, and that sort of thing. That might actually be something we could do here with the for each. So uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and use alerts here. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start throwing some alerts in with a little bit of message with each one. Uh, like here, I'm going to print out the value of nums, right, just to see what nums is. Uh, maybe somewhere in here, uh, maybe here inside the for each, I'll do an alert where I'll print out uh, uh, for each v, letting me know that I'm looking at the value of v, and I'll actually print out that value in each one of those alerts. Maybe after the for each is done, I'll do another alert. Right, where I'll print out the value of total. There we go, something like that. No, really no reason to print out the value of average because we're already seeing that in our last output. So hopefully just with those uh, three alerts in there, that'll be enough to kind of give me a bit better idea of what exactly is going on in the script. So let me go back over to Safari and rerun this again. Enter my numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Right. So there's my array, one, two, three, four, five, and my nums array. I can see that they all did go into the array the way I expected them to. Right. Now we're into the for each. It's telling me inside the for each, v is one, now v is two, now v is three, and four, and five. Okay. So it went through all the for each's the way I expected it to. Now this is interesting. Uh, we've now gotten to the part of the script where it's displaying the final total right before it actually does the division. And here it's telling me that the total is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now that looks like that's probably the root of our problem. The total should have been 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Not all of those numbers strung together the way they are right now. Okay. So that's probably what's going wrong here, right? is uh, actually right in here, it looks like, where we're doing total plus equals v. Instead of actually doing numeric addition, it's doing an append, probably because v is a string. So I think that's our problem, and that's probably what we'll need to do to fix it. And that's kind of how the alerts can help you track down that sort of problem. Once a problem is fixed, we would probably eventually come back and take these alerts back out of the script again, since that wouldn't be output that we actually want the user to see. This is just a tool that we're using to help us get the script to work correctly. If it's a longer and more complicated script, or maybe something that's sort of in process, something else you might want to do is set your script up so that the alerts can kind of be turned on and off. The way you can do that is, uh, the way I usually do this, is I usually create a variable, I call it debug, and then I assign it a value of either true or false. Then what you can do with each one of your alerts, oops, is you can say uh, debug, use the conditional operator, 
right? Something like that. So if debug is true, it'll show the alert. Otherwise, it won't show anything at all. So I could come through and do that for each one of my alerts. Debug, alert, colon, empty string. Same thing for this one. There we go. So with debug set to true, when I run this in my browser, right, I see all my alerts. Right? But if I come back to my script and I set debug equal to false, okay, no alerts pop up. So that's kind of a good intermediate step. If you're not quite ready or not quite willing to actually take all of your debugging alert statements out, you can actually set up something like this where you can turn them on and off, potentially even leaving them in the final script, although it will increase its size sort of unnecessarily. But if you ever do need to come back and debug that script further in the future, it's nice to already have all your debugging alerts in there and simply just need to be able to turn them on. Okay. So uh, that's a, a nice thing to be able to do, a nice way to be able to debug your scripts and try to uh, find problems, especially logic problems, that may be occurring. Uh, I've, of course, been showing you all this in uh, Safari, right? but uh, all of it, of course, would work exactly the same way in any browser. If we go back over to Firefox and I hit refresh, put in my numbers, there. you can see that I'm getting my alerts popping up. Right? So this is a technique that not only would work good in Safari and Firefox, but you could certainly also use this in Internet Explorer, and would pretty much have to since you don't have a whole lot of any, a whole lot of other tools to actually work with. Um, now, I think I mentioned before, but just in case I didn't, these alerts could of course be replaced with document.write lines if you'd prefer to see some of that debugging output in that format, although that tends to become less and less useful as your scripts become more complex and stop uh, being scripts that are actually here in the body that produce uh, page content when they become more dynamic and more sort of behind the scenes. I think in the long run you'll find that alerts work a lot better for debugging than document.write lines do. All right. Let me go ahead and turn these debugs back off. All right. As a matter of fact, um, I think I'll go ahead and for the moment and actually strip them out again, actually take out all those debugs something like that because right? I wanted to show you one other neat little feature that we have uh, over in uh, Firefox I'm sorry not Firefox over in Safari when you actually go into the error console there you'll find that uh, Safari actually does a lot more than just show you errors it actually has a full-blown JavaScript debugger built into it Basically the way it works is once you've gone into the error console, you have a series of uh, different sections you can choose from right here. If you go to the one called scripts, <clears throat> right, there's actually a button that will appear in there called enable debugging. If you click on that enable debugging button, it will put the browser into a sort of a JavaScript debugging mode where it will then actually give you some other capabilities for uh, going through the script that can be quite handy. Uh, what I can do here while I'm in this mode is if I come over to the side and actually click the pause button right, and then hit the refresh for the browser, when it refreshes and comes back to reload the page, it doesn't automatically go through every line of my script. Instead, it will actually stop at each individual line and let me choose when it should actually be executed. So here in the code, it's showing me that it's at the beginning script tag. Right? If I click the button that has the down arrow pointing at the dot, okay, it will let me step into that next statement. Right? So I click it. It's now highlighting my prompt statement. If I click the button again, it executes the prompt statement. So I can go ahead and do my input. Right. I'll click the uh, next. It's going to do the split on the, uh, the uh, string that the user entered. Okay. I'll go ahead and click the button again. So it executes that. All right. At that point, another neat little thing you can do is down in the actual console itself, down here at the bottom, if you type in the name of any particular variable, like if I type in uh, input, for example, right, it will actually show me the value of that variable. So input, you'll remember, was the variable where I initially stored the user's input, and this is the actual input that the user entered. At this point, we've also taken that input and we've split it into an array. If I type out the name of the array, it shows me the actual content of that array. So I can kind of sort of live keep an eye on the values of the different variables this way without actually having to go through and put in the alerts. Right? Let me go ahead and take another step. I'll have it execute the total equals zero line. Right? Next, it's up to the uh, nums.foreach method. Okay? So I will click uh, the button to go on with that one. 
Okay, there it's adding to the total. I keep clicking the button. We get to see it go through this little loop each time for each one of the separate values. Okay, at any time in there, I could come down to my debug console and type the name of one of my variables. For example, I could come down and see what the total is. So there's the same problem we tracked down before: the fact that those numbers are all being appended. Okay. And uh, just keep clicking it. Eventually, we did our average statement. It's now asking about doing the document dot right line. I'll go ahead and click that button one final time. Oh, one more time. There we go. All right. There's my actual incorrect average that shows up, and pretty much everything is done. So that's another neat little tool, another neat little way you can go through and debug your program. Actually, have a more sophisticated tool like Safari's debug console here go through and let you execute your program one line at a time, where you can actually keep an eye on what order those statements are executing in and the values of any of your different variables that you might come across as your script is actually executing. Right? Just to go ahead and be thorough with this, I do want to go ahead and fix this problem. So let me go back over to my text editor. All right. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the value of V, which is actually the value of each one of the separate elements of the array. I'm going to tell JavaScript to parse it as an integer. So each one of those will become an integer instead of a string, which means my plus equals over here should do integer arithmetic, integer addition, instead of appending the way they were before with the strings. If I come back and run it in my browser now, one, two, three, four, five, my average is three. So that was all it really took to fix it was putting in this parse int here. But while that might seem simple sort of on the surface when you see the solution, a lot of times tracking down what the problem is in the first place is the part that's really tricky. So there's a number of different ways that that can be done as we've seen. There's uh, actually using in browser tools like the debug consoles, the error consoles, those sorts of things. Or if those let you down or if you just don't like them for whatever reason, there's of course always the good old manual way of actually putting in alert statements or document.write lines to help you keep up with what's actually going on inside the guts of the script.